What's up, everybody? This is Alex Christopher with The Duran, and I'm here with Alexander McCurse, Editor-in-Chief of The Duran. And today we're going to be taking a look at Ukraine, Nord Stream, and the fact that Ukraine has put a commitment to join the EU and NATO into its constitution. All right, Alexander, so this is a, a roundup as to what's going on in Ukraine. All of it is not very good news, not very good news for, for Russia, not very good news for Europe, I would say, not very good news for the Ukraine. Um, from energy to the European Union to NATO, what's happening in Ukraine, Alexander? Give us the, the roundup. And I also want to mention that we'll put an article from the Off Guardian, which mentions the, uh, the fact that Ukraine has, uh, has put in the, the commitment to join the EU and NATO. We'll put a link to that article down below as well, which is one of the topics yeah. we'll be talking about in this video. Yeah. I, I, I mean, first of all, it's, it, it's, it's a very bad situation. It's a terrible situation. And Ukraine's situation is a terrible one. I mean, we have an election underway, presidential election underway in Ukraine. Uh, president Poroshenko, who is the incumbent, incumbent president, is pulling out all the stops by taking an extreme nationalist position. We've seen what he did with the church, uh, the way he split the Orthodox Church, or tried to split the Orthodox Church by setting up this, uh, uh, I would say, phony church, this phony Ukrainian Orthodox Church, and got the Constantinople Patriarch to back it. And he's now maneuvering in all sorts of other ways to try to get uh, 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 the um, anti-Russian vote on his side. Now, this um, this change to the constitution that's been done, I think serves two purposes. And let's be very clear about this. It is Poroshenko who is behind it. Firstly, it's intended to put his political opponents, Timoshenko and Zelensky, this very interesting comedian, former comedian, who is now leading the polls. It's intended to put them on the defensive. But it's also intended, if either of these two candidates, either Timoshenko or Zelensky, win the election instead of Poroshenko, to bind them into following his policies, which are anti-Russian policies, in other words, by committing Ukraine to joining the NATO, NATO and the EU, it makes any move by Zelensky or Timoshenko to try to reorient Ukraine back towards a closer relationship with Russia, arguably unconstitutional. And we've seen how a similar thing was done in Moldova, and it has been used by the anti-Russian minority in Moldova as a device to basically clip the wings of the president of Moldova, Igor Dodon, who wants to improve relations with Russia. And I suspect we're going to see the same thing happen with whatever candidate wins the election in Ukraine if it is not uh, uh, um, Poroshenko. And what that will do is it will create further division within Ukraine. It will create a deepening political crisis and conflict within Ukraine because it will mean that removing any president who can be described by the 15% of the population that are fiercely anti-Russian as pro-Russian it opens the way for any such president to be removed from office. And that's what we've seen in Ukraine happen before. And that's what I suspect they're preparing the ground to do in Ukraine again. Now, can I say about the aspiration to join the NATO and the EU, which is contained in this constitutional amendment, I don't think there is any prospect of that happening in any foreseeable future. The EU are exhausted by Ukraine. They are not prepared to uh, see Ukraine join either the EU or NATO. And the EU's most powerful country, which is Germany, is so tired of Ukraine that they have stabbed it in the back 
by agreeing to the Nord Stream 2 pipeline deal with Russia, which is going to eventually result in uh, uh, gas transit being uh, 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 diverted away from Ukraine. So we shouldn't see this uh, constitutional change as a uh, um, real aspiration on the part of the Ukrainian political class. We should see it rather as an attempt to institutionalize through the constitution an anti-Russian policy within Ukraine itself and to uh, uh, outflank any pro any any political leader in U- in Ukraine who seeks to achieve a rapprochement with Russia. All right. So I, I want you, Alexander, to dig a little deeper into the Nord Stream 2 and how it affects Ukraine, how it's going to yeah. affect the Ukrainian economy. But before you do that, now that I have this fresh in my mind, the, judging from what you said, it seems that the EU was not behind this move by Poroshenko, mm-hmm. i.e. they didn't push him to, to hard code this into the Ukraine constitution. But I do, I do see a benefit for NATO here. NATO does seem to benefit from this in that it does put a pretty permanent wedge between Ukraine and Russia. Is that an accurate statement that this is not very good for Europe, what's happening in Ukraine right now? But if there is one winner in all of this, and I think I mentioned in my intro, that it's not good for Ukraine, it's not good for Russia, it's not good for Europe. But if there is one winner in all of this, it's NATO. You're absolutely right. And can I just say, um, um, you said that the EU is not involved in this. Of course, there are some EU politicians who are also NATO politicians who are undoubtedly okay, involved yeah. in all of this. Because the whole point about the Maidan uh, uh, events of 2014, 2013, 2014, was to draw away Ukraine from Russia. The natural trajectory of Ukraine was towards deeper integration with Russia. The whole strategy has been to drive a wedge between Ukraine and Russia, and this constitutional amendment effectively consolidates it. It now puts it on a legal and constitutional basis. And that is exactly what the objective has been right the way through, and we see another step being executed to fulfill it. The one thing I would say is that, of course, it's a game that some NATO states and some people in the United States are very keen on. The people who have to pick up the bills for this strategy, first and foremost, the Germans, but also some of the other uh, 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 Central European states are becoming increasingly exasperated by, because from their point of view, they have no interest in seeing a broken Ukraine, which is a bottomless pit for their money, and uh, which is continuously creating a problems between them, that is to say the Germans, and the Central Europeans, and the Russians, with whom these countries have very important economic and political relations, which are vital for their long-term economic future and for peace on the European continent. Now, I'll get into the the economic implications yeah. for Ukraine yeah. with regard to Germany and the Nord Stream too. Yes, I mean, I think this this simply cannot be um, 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 uh, overestimated. I mean. What Nord Stream 2 is doing um, is it is undermining Ukraine's position as the key transit country for the supply of gas from Russia to Europe, first and foremost, of course, to Germany. Now, the thing to understand is that it was the Soviet Union that created the pipelines whereby uh, um, Russian gas has flowed to Europe. And Ukraine being at that time a constituent republic of the, of the, of the, of the Soviet Union, um, naturally and logically, those pipelines were largely built over, uh, across Ukraine. Now, the Ukrainians have exploited that in two ways. Firstly, uh, an awful lot of money from the Russians and the Germans in transit fees. Um, because of the gas destined for Europe and for Germany that has been passing across their border. The second thing they've been doing is they've been siphoning off gas or they've been uh, uh, importing gas across these pipelines from Russia at cheap prices 
and they've been selling it on the European market at higher prices. What Nord Stream 2 is going to do is it's going to make these arrangements ultimately impossible. And in terms of the transit fees, that is very important for the Germans because what has been happening is that the Germans have been paying transit fees to the Ukrainians for gas, and then, because of this commitment that has been foisted on Germany to support Ukraine, the Germans have then been re-exporting some of that gas at lower prices, some of that Russian gas at lower prices to Ukraine. So they're paying Ukraine a double, a double subsidy. They're paying Ukraine transit fees for gas, which is supposed to pay going to Germany. And at the same time, they're supplying, they're returning that gas at a low price to Ukraine. And German business, German industry has, an, has had enough of it. So what happens now? Ukraine loses its position as a gas transit state. It's no longer in a position to hold uh, Europe to ransom as it did in 2006, 2009, when it essentially st interrupted, it stopped gas deliveries. Uh, 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 to, to Central and Western Europe across its, across its territory. It loses money. It loses a big export uh, um, that it had, which is a Russian gas, which it was re-exporting to Europe, and it loses the transit fees. So Ukraine comes out looking very bad out of the development of Nord Stream 2, and that is exactly why the Germans are backing it. And now you mentioned before we did this video briefly, and I want you to touch upon that as well, that Ukraine is also now importing coal from the Donbass. Is yeah. that true? What's going on yes, there? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, it seems what's happening. I mean, I, I think one, one thing we should say is that the Ukrainian economy, in my opinion, uh, uh, um, when you unscramble the figures, it's either stagnant at a very low level, I mean, it crashed in 2014 after the Maidan events, and it's never recovered. In my opinion, it's either, uh, 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 it's either stagnating or it is possibly even contracting. But it needs coal from the Donbass to keep what's left of its end industries still running. Now, for political reasons, Ukraine pretends that it is no longer importing coal from the Donbass. It seems what it is actually doing, and this is the Poroshenko government, is actually importing coal from the Donbass. This is to say from these two republics uh, um, in the Donbass, the, the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics, which have broken away from Ukraine, is importing their coal by using Belarus as a middleman. And at the same time, very interestingly, at the same time as it is pretending that it is cutting off all its economic links with Russia, trade with Russia over the last year actually grew. And Russia remains Ukraine's leading economic partner. So what all this shows is that all these attempts by Ukraine to move away its economy from its natural trade connections with the Donbass and with Russia are failing and that the attempt to do so is causing its economy either to stagnate or to contract and the incomes, the living standards of people in Ukraine to fall. All right. So the Ukraine economy continues to gravitate naturally where it should, which is towards Russia and, and yes. towards Eurasia and the East. But you have NATO making sure that politically Ukraine moves towards the, the Euro-Atlanticists and towards the West. Well, is, or, is this, or, or, yeah, this is a good summary. That's a good summary. Or if, it, or, or if it doesn't actually move towards them through this constitutional amendment and other it devices. It can't go the other way. It can't go the other yeah. way, which leaves it in perpetual limbo. Or to it, be torn it, apart. It, it, it is free or to be torn apart. But, I mean, rather than let it become integrated in Eurasia, where economically it naturally belongs, 
they would rather smash it. They would rather break it. Yeah. That, that's effectively what this, this commitment to join the EU and NATO and the Constitution, that's effectively what it does. Is it keeps exactly. Ukraine either down or it makes sure that Ukraine just, it, it's a slow motion destruction of, of, of a nation. Exactly. That is exactly what it is. Carried out uh, uh, for the most cynical geopolitical objectives. I can remember um, back, I think it was in 2011, when uh, uh, the Russians and the various other um, um, former Soviet states, including at that time, to some extent Ukraine, were setting up the Eurasian Union. Uh, Hillary Clinton said that this is um, all about recreating the Soviet Union, which, by the way, it wasn't, and the United States would act to prevent it. And here we see the United States acting to prevent the reintegration economically and in some ways politically, Ukraine with its natural partners in Eurasia, even at the price of breaking the country apart. All right, so we'll put a link to this article uh, from the Off Guardian. Um, Ukraine embeds irreversible commitment to join EU and NATO into its constitution. You mentioned that Moldova went through the same thing. Is this the new NATO tactic? Yes, it is the new NATO tactic. It creates in these countries a situation of perpetual crisis because uh, any president now elected either in Moldova or Ukraine, in Moldova this is happening all the time, faces continuous legal challenges and continuous threats of impeachment and removal from office if he or she tries to reverse this trajectory. And um, it's undemocratic, but it is being done. Is Georgia next? Yes, I think it probably is. I, I think Georgia is next, yes. All right. Alexander McCurse, Editor-in-Chief of The Draft, thank you very much. Guys, if you like this video, click on that subscribe button down below and click on the notifications bell to get notifications every time we push out a new video. And visit The Duran Shop, pick up a t-shirt, help support The Duran. In the description box down below, you'll find the link to our PayPal and Patreon pages. Please donate to The Duran, it really helps us out a lot. And you can get a copy of this video in audio format. Follow us on iTunes and SoundCloud. And don't forget, go to theduran.com to see all the articles that Alexander links up to every day. Alexander McCurse, Editor-in-Chief of The Durant, thank you once again. Until next time, everybody, take care.